God's word, faithfully preached, is his comprehensive equipment for changing lives, delivering them from the shackles of sin, the flesh, and the world, and transforming them into useful vessels through whom Jesus can pour out his blessings. Living Seed invites you to a feast of the truth as God's servant brings to us the word of life. The clergy, the apex clergy, exercising spiritual oversight. So we're going to be, it's wonderful to talk about oversight, oversight, but it will be critical for us to narrow our thoughts within the space we have on what critical issues must an apex leader exercise spiritual oversight. What critical issues? There are many, many issues that everybody is expecting an overseer to be involved, to know everything, everything, everything. But what are the very critical issues in which if an overseer does not have time to attend any other thing, he must never fail to provide oversight in this? Critical issues that requires spiritual oversight from an apex leader. But we read our text, verse 1 to 4 of First Peter chapter 5. I read from the ESV version now before I swing back to my old King James. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you exercising oversight not under compulsion but willingly but as God will have you not for shameful gain but eagerly not domineering over those in your church but being examples to the flock and when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the unfading crown of glory. May the Lord bless his word to our heart as we study and as we pray together in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now permit me to set the context for our text before we begin to draw the issues, crucial issues, where an overseer a church top leader, an apex man of the clergy, need to exercise spiritual oversight. The first, I just want to note that this exhortation is coming not from a novice. This exhortation was coming from Peter and his credential for bringing that authoritative exhortation onto the leaders was that he himself has been one. You don't have authority to speak into a situation or into people's life when you are lacking in that experience. You'll be wondering how I'm going to go about my instructions this morning. But I found that in the context of that introduction, say, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. 
Now, that for me is the first critical issue of oversight. For you to continue to have relevance as a spiritual leader and as an apex leader, as the archbishop, as the president of the denomination, or president of the conference, as the, the overall uh, overseer of a whole denomination, there is one oversight you must never, never miss. And what is that? The oversight of your own life in terms of continuous growth and experience in the things of God. As simple as it appears, that is the first crucial issue where you need to exercise oversight. But now this oversight is not first the oversight over other people. It is the oversight over your own personal, progressive, relevant experience of God and of ministry. For when you are not able to have that kind of experience, your leadership to provide oversight over others will be vague. It will lack authority. And it can be easily pushed around. And then you can easily become a figurehead. When the people under you, when they know more than you, when the people that you want to provide oversight over, when they see ahead of you, you can never provide supervision for a man whose vision is more than yours. Because the word supervision actually means superior vision. If you don't have a vision that's superior, that supersedes what I see, how can you supervise it? You cannot supervise. You cannot superintend a vision that you never have. So, whenever God is preparing a man to come into leadership at the apex, the first thing God does is for God to push him ahead. It's for God to expose him unto so many, 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 many things that when he stands up in the office, there will be nothing that anybody under your hand is going through that you have not gone through before. Ah, are you hearing me at all? Let it not be that you stand up, you are speaking over an issue, and somebody under you raises his hand and says, Excuse me, sir. Stop telling us theory. What are you saying? Have you experienced it before? You say, well, even though I've not experienced it, keep quiet. You know what is going to happen? Is that whatever you are saying carries no weight anymore. Because you are trying to superintend over a place where you have never tread. 
So the first critical issue that gives content unto spiritual oversight over the flock is that the overseer himself has taken time has concentrated and focused on his own personal life, his own personal growth, his own personal experience, and in fact, his own personal ministry. This is what will give you the space to provide oversight over those that are under you. Why I'm not proposing that you must become a Methuselah who is very aged before we can give you opportunity to provide leadership and oversight. That's not what I'm proposing. But I'm deeply saying the moment you step into apex leadership, it imposes upon you to first take heed to your own growth, to your own experience, to your own ministry, even to the way you have experienced God, it is because it is a requirement to be a relevant overseer. So when Peter was going to write and say, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock. That's authority. Am I right? I wish every time you are speaking, you want to guide pastors, but you've never pastored before. There's going to be a problem. Am I right? If the people under you want to trouble you, They will simply raise some pastoral issues that you are completely unfamiliar with. So which means the first issue that you must not fail to take personal oversight over is the issue of your personal personal growth, personal experience of ministry, and let it not be obsolete. Let it be current. Let it be what? Current. You will not be able to supervise missionaries if you have never been on the mission field. Oh my God, am I confusing things? So, what is what am I to do when I become an overseer? When I become an apex leader, so that I can have space and authority to be able to take oversight over the people. I must first of all see to it. If we are sending men here and there on mission, so that when I'm speaking, I'm speaking with authority, what must I do? If I've never been settled on a mission field before, then it becomes my necessary need to take time out and go where? Go on mission fields. It is critical. If you don't do that, your authority will become official. 
your authority will be abstract and it will carry little or no weight did God do that to Jesus in order to qualify him for the office that he was to occupy yes Please go with me to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. And we will quickly read that so that we can move on from that first critical issue. Even though there will be many, many other issues, but if this first critical issue is taken care of, several other issues become easy to handle in leadership. Look at it. Hebrews chapter 2. When you get to Hebrews 2, we will read from verse 9. Verse 9, verse 10. But we see him, we see Jesus. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, the word became, uh, in other version use, it was fitting. It was proper. It was necessary. It became him. For whom are all things and by whom are all things. In bringing many sons unto glory. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. It was necessary. I read it from ESV now. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now, if I look at that from Amplified Bible, I wanted to hear how it sounds. It was an act worthy of God and fitting to the divine nature that he, for whose sake and by whom all things have their existence, in bringing many sons into glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect. And the word perfect means to bring him to maturity, the human experience necessary to be perfectly equipped for his office as high priest through suffering. Did you understand the meaning of this? That God was looking for Jesus to be the high priest. But for him to actually fit that office, for him to actually sit in that office and his two legs will touch the ground, for him to occupy that office and nobody will have the right to say who are you what are you talking about God did not think it wrong he thought it was necessary to prepare Jesus for that office to bring him onto maturity in the human experiences that is necessary to fit him for that office as a high priest through suffering. So that the Bible says, we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Do you know why? The Bible says, in that he had been tempted at all points as we are yet without sin because he knows how he feels he knows what it means to suffer 
He has experienced lack before. So he knows when there is no food, how somebody feels. He knows the temptation that the devil will bring when there is no money in your pocket. He has seen that before. He had been arrested by tax collectors. Oh my God, you are not hearing me. Tax collectors put a, a what is it now? They are, they, are, they are barricade on the road. You have passed some of these boys that are canny. And they say, stop! With nails. My master experienced that. He came somewhere and said, stop it! Where are your tax receipts? And Jesus said, ah, do they collect tax from indigents or from, from foreigners? They said, it's from foreigners. They said, but we're indigents. Why are they stopping us? And this boy was just difficult. He said, you are going nowhere unless you pay. And for you to know the embarrassment, they asked Judas Iscariot, Judas, any money in the post? As usual, he said, not the whole, we finished everything the other day. As usual, as usual. That's the treasurer with a leaking pocket. As usual. And yet, Jesus cannot go. So he stood there. And he said, Peter, take your hook. Go to the riverside. There's a fish you will catch. Open his mouth. There's a coin to pay for you and for me. If they didn't stop them, there was no need for that urgency. So he waited there. So when Jesus becomes our high priest, you cannot come and tell him, oh Lord, you don't know how it feels. I've not been able to pay for my license. He said, I know. I am familiar with that. He knows what it means to be ridiculed by your family members because of your ministry. His junior brothers didn't believe him. One time they were going for a program and his brothers came and said, are you not going for that program? Jesus said, I'm not going yet. He said, what are you waiting for? You keep saying that you are a man of God, a man of God. Go and show yourself there. Go and prove yourself there. And Jesus said, your time is always there. Go. My time to go there has not come. That's how you talk. Even his brothers didn't honor him until he died. So if you say, well, you know, the reason why this ministry is difficult is that I, I, I don't have something to, to, to silence my junior brother. They are abusing me because I'm a pastor. He said, I am familiar with that. So for Jesus to be our high priest, and there will be nothing in human experience that he will be unfamiliar with, God took time to subject him so that at all points when he speaks, he speaks with authority. Are we together? Now, that's what I'm saying. As an apex leader, the first crucial issue of oversight is to expose your life as to continue to gain experience of the things in which those under you are grappling so that when you stand up to minister to them you are ministering out of life and you are speaking in context when you preach you are preaching at someone who knows when you pray you are praying as someone who has been touched when a staff when a pastor when a, one of your other overseers who are under you 
when they come and say there's a need, you know how to rush at it because you have been in that situation before. To me, to be an apex leader who is not having experience who is not growing in a life touching experience in his own life is to reduce the authority of the office where you are standing so what do I want to say now the first oversight crucial that every man who is in leadership must have is that oversight of his own life of his own growth of his own experience of his own exposure that makes him always fresh always relevant always able to speak and he's not speaking theoretically he's speaking life how do we do that there are two ways or three the first is never to aspire onto a leadership position if you have not grown through the ranks The reason is because growing through the ranks being exposed to everything that everybody is exposed to before you came to the top of the ladder gives you a first hand experience that makes whatever anybody who is at any level of the ladder is talking about you are not, you are not straight to it if they are saying, you know, in my own church, the elders are very troublesome, you laugh. You say, yes, they were more troublesome when I was there than you. There was a meeting in 1983 when I was just occupying the kind of position you are, when all the elders excuse me to go out and they took a decision they said we want pastor to please excuse us and they put me outside and they took a decision and their decision was that I must pack out of the pastorium that they don't need me again and I ran to the headquarters instead of the headquarters to sympathize with me they rather supported the elders because they are the ones that normally bring money to the church and they say go and beg them I say oh my god with my Bible in my hand go and beg them what did I have to do I went to I knelt down for these elders today I am the president of the denomination all the elders they come to me now I beg them so that they did not throw me out when I was just starting brother the elders that you are talking about have they checked you out here and say no sir have they locked the pastorium against you say no not yet it was just a meeting that we had and I brought a proposal and they refused. That's all that is pending is uh, go and relax. Now, do you know that when you brought that story and you are telling this pastor that he's aggrieved, something enters his head immediately. He knows that he has a leader who knows. If you have grown through the ranks it might give you a basis to exercise leadership as a man who is familiar with the suffering 
with the challenges, with the complications, with the conflicts that people go through when they are growing in ministry. But supposing you just became a bishop from the from the university. You've never been a pastor. They just picked you from the classroom and you became the bishop. You are a lecturer. So every time you stood up, you gave lectures. How can a lecturer lead pastors? They said, don't mind them. We are not in the classroom, oh. All this Greek and uh, Aramaic you are analyzing. Go to the field and see whether you can still talk. So what does that man do? So that he can still provide oversight. He need to do what I call crash program. And what does that crash program require? First put aside the regalia and go to the field. Go and sit down with them one week, two weeks and begin to experience some of the challenges because God has lifted you up. It won't take time before you know what to do with those that are suffering. You cannot provide an exercise spiritual oversight where you have no sight. And you need four kinds of sights which I want you to deal with. You need the ordinary sight. Ability to see what is going on. Ability to see. You just need to go around, just see with your eyes. You need to see what is going on. Then you need another sight. You need what I call hindsight. What is hindsight? Sight from behind. Hallelujah. You know, hindsight. Even though people think it is negative, but it's also a good sight. Something you can look back and say, oh, from the benefit of hindsight, we should not have done this. Wow, if I was wiser, I would not have done this. A leader need hindsight. That helps him to see that, oh, when I was not in this office, I didn't know the issue that people are grappling with. I spoke so theoretically, and there was nothing in what I say. I'm now facing the reality. With the benefit of hindsight, we would not have done that. And then you need foresight what is foresight sight forward being able to see what is far away as to be able to bring people to begin to envision the days ahead I will deal with that differently because it's important but then the most important sight you must have is insight I said ordinary sight, hindsight, foresight, and what is the last sight? Insight. Insight. Insight knowledge into things. That's what gives you leadership space over those that you are leading. So how do I gain all of this? 
If I grew through the ranks, that gives me a little platform. But because life is not stagnant, for me not to be speaking history, and they say, sir, in your days, that's old-fashioned. You must be current. Which means, as far as I'm concerned, the oversight that I must first have is that oversight over my growth, over my current experience, over my current exposure, and over my ministry. So can I beg all of you sitting here? Can I beg you? Don't suspend ministry for administration. If you suspend ministry for administration, you will lose capacity to exercise oversight over the ministry of people under you. So how will you not suspend ministry? Don't stop preaching. You are not getting me again. What I say don't do? Don't stop preaching. No matter how busy your administrative office is, you are basically a preacher. Am I right? It is because God called you to preach the word. That's why you are here. If you stop preaching, I'm preaching the word of God because you are so busy with administration. Very soon, you will lose touch with preachers. And your exercise of oversight over their lives will be vague. So to continue to develop your spiritual oversight over people, the first oversight is to make sure that the things in which God will want you to supervise others, you have not stopped doing it. Don't stop preaching. Don't stop witnessing. Did you hear me? Don't stop leading people to Christ. When you stop doing all these things, what you don't know is that you are only making your leadership official rather than spiritual. The joy of a soul winner. How many of you had the joy of a soul winner before? Let me see your hand up. That when you preach, you saw a soul who is wicked, who is a wreck, a drunkard, and under your preaching, as you just prayed to him, he repented, and you saw his life change. What happened to you? There was joy. There was joy. I want to tell you the truth is this. Did you know that whether people gave you money or not, as long as you kept seeing souls saved, you forgot money. Am I right? You were eager to keep preaching because every soul that you saved lubricates you, gave you joy, and made you strong. When the joy of the Lord is no more your strength, you'll be looking for something else. You'll be getting sick. But you know the major problem when we become apex leaders is that they seem to promote us out of what God made us to do. So what must you do? Take care. It's a crucial oversight you must not lose. When you lose that oversight, sir, 
you lose authority over lives. Don't stop winning souls. Don't stop doing one-to-one -one work. My Lord Bishop, how wonderful it is that you just sent for uh, somebody into your bishop court and say, please call me Mr. Chukum, I want to see him. And he came. And you sat with him on the couch and said, Chukuma, how long will you continue to roam about in life? When you were in your thirties, we pursued you. You were doing like this, doing like this, doing like this. You are now 41. I mean, you are now 51. You are still a drunkard. What are you doing with your life? Even though I'm the bishop over this diocese, my heart has never left you. I thought I should call you and speak to you. I don't want to leave this diocese without seeing you on the road to heaven. Do you know what will happen to Chukuma? I'm telling you what will happen to him. He will break down. He said, Bishop, as busy as you are, you mean you still remember me? When I see you dressed in the bishopric crown, I thought you don't see people like us. So you still know me by name? Baba, I don't want to continue like this. I don't know why I couldn't stop drinking. Pray for me. You now bring out the Bible. A new heart will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I will take away from you the heart of stone. This is what Jesus said. And he has told me that whosoever sin I remit here on earth shall be remitted in heaven. Knee down, I'll pray for you. Your heart will change this afternoon. Go and gather all the bottles of beer in your house. Go and burn them. And I would like to meet with you for one week. I have only one hour. You know I'm busy, but I will create that one hour for you. Let me ask you, will Chukuma keep that appointment? Eh? Aha. So when that man has now repented, you know, I say, which parish is closer to your house? He say, it's St. Uh, St. Peter's Parish. It's all right. Go and tell the vicar that I sent you to him. That from now on, you will be responsible in that church. Do you know what the vicar of St. Peter will do? He say, my Lord Bishop, how did you get him? He's one of the troublemakers. He said, yes. I got him. Watch over him. And report to me how he is doing. With, with your pastor in Zemvikas, will he make sure that Chukuma didn't get lost? Will he? He will. Because it was a personal assignment given to him by my bishop. Don't let go the things that made you. Otherwise, you will become perforated. What makes many leaders to lose spiritual authority is that the things that, they, that made them that formulated them, that constituted their lives and their grace, they have abandoned it. Spiritual oversight, if it is going to be exercised, it must be exercised in the context of your own life. Hallelujah. Baba already spoke what I will have said. 
he said it this morning. Don't stop praying and don't stop attending prayer meeting. All of this have packaged it in the first crucial issue of oversight. That for me to remain spiritually qualified to provide oversight to people, I must be currently engaged in the things in which I want to supervise them. Don't stop teaching. Apex leaders, are you hearing me? What did I say? You should not stop. Don't stop teaching. What you don't understand is that the authority vested on you is only enhanced because of ministry, not because of administration. What did I want to say? The apostles, those first apostles, when the work grew and the number of disciples multiplied and there was much administration in Acts chapter 6, what did those brothers do? They called themselves together. They said, brothers, it is not proper. It is not reasonable for us to leave, to forsake the ministry of prayer and of the word of God to serve tables. If we do this, something will perish. Something will die out. Everything will become noise. Let us devote ourselves to prayer. So when Baba spoke in the morning and said, the intercessory life of an overseer, it must be solitary. It must be persevering. Please, sir, don't stop praying. And don't stop attending what? Prayer meeting. The reason is because the edification you need to keep you fresh. If you choose not to attend a prayer meeting, nobody will ask you. Am I right? You know, as a leader, you can be rotten in your house. People thought you know what you are doing. They presume that you know what you are doing. Sometimes a leader, a top leader, is gradually getting addicted to television. He's watching television into the middle of the night. But everybody believes that Baba knows what he's doing. Nobody comes across and says, Ah, my Lord, what are you watching here? They won't say that. They'll just look like this. They say, hey, so Baba can watch this. Maybe he's getting inspiration. <laughs> nobody, nobody can stop him. And now that the internet has become so freely available, you could find yourself now surfing into the web until you are caught in the web. But nobody will ask you and say, what are you doing? They say, Baba, he's preparing his, uh, his, his, his seminar. They don't know that Baba is going. You must be the one that brings yourself to attend the prayer meeting. But do you know what happens? While you are in the prayer meeting, you carry the presence. 
you carry leadership into that meeting. The glory of God will not only descend, it will refresh you. So when you want to exercise spiritual oversight over your pastors who are no more praying, you know you have authority. Eh? You say, I was in the prime meeting last Wednesday and it was this young boy that led. I was really, really touched when he just pulled out one scripture from 1 Samuel chapter 15 as if I've never read that before. The young man just rattled, 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 but he spoke to my life. And I saw that something needed to be done. Oh, I was really blessed last Wednesday. You've not said anything. Your venerable, who has never attended prayer meeting again for the past six months, because he's now venerable, something pricked his heart. You mean Bishop still go for prayer meeting? So when you gather the archdeacons or the RCC chairmen or the EC chairpersons and secretary depending on your different uh, groupings and you are asking them when last did you attend prayer meeting? You. So you are too big to go for prayer meeting? Eh? Chairman. Do you know that you don't need to say more than that? Fear will grip them because you are speaking from authority of life. But when you have abandoned those things, do you have any moral right to demand that those your venerables, those your presbyters should go for prayer meeting? You don't. Your oversight over them in this area becomes vague. So, the strength of bearing and exercising spiritual oversight is not first external. The strength of exercising spiritual oversight is the strength that emanates from the life that you yourself, you are bearing oversight over. To make sure you don't lose out on all those little ingredients that made you. So when this brother said, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The Bible said, and the word of God multiplied. And the number of disciples, you know, multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great number of priests became obedient to the faith exercising spiritual authority, exercising spiritual oversight, it begins with my continuous growth. I want to keep doing that all the time. I want to keep starting afresh with new lives, new converts, new people, so that I can be, you know, I can be in touch with what is going on. One of the joy I have is to keep going back to the young people. Because when you interact with the young people, you become young. Am I right? If you keep company with the old people, you will soon die. <laughs> I'm just, I'm telling you the truth, sir. I'm telling you. You see, if you meet old people, look at their discussion. What's the discussion of something with eight, uh, 70 years? What's his discussion? He's talking about when he will die. He's talking about how he will be buried. He's talking about where he will be buried. And as he's telling you that every day, you yourself, you're also saying, yes, actually. <laughs> actually. <laughs> but when you meet young people, that are still anticipating what they will do for God in 50 years. You don't know where strength comes. Your ideas get revitalized. You grow younger. As they are running, they are running. 
they forget that you are old. But because you want to keep pace with them, you also double your step a bit. And you say, look, young man, you know I'm old. I want to go with you, but let's be going. Uh -huh. You know, they exercise you and wake up something that is dying in your spirit. If God did it for Jesus, that made him to be one that cannot be but touch with the feelings of our infirmity. It must be a continuous oversight for me. Hallelujah. So when I saw Peter giving this exhortation, said to you elders, even me also as an elder, so there's nothing you had that you can shout about. I am also an elder. And I'm also an elder actually before you. So sit down and listen to an elder of elders. Listen to the pastor of pastors. I said, don't stop preaching. Don't stop teaching. Sometimes I watch when I attend some of your clergy retreats. You are doing clergy retreat from, for your douses. I am not saying you should dominate the pulpit. But I want to insist. Allow the synod and allow the clergy and allow the douses to hear you teach. It's important. It takes only two years to produce a diploma in account. Am I correct? Sir? And it takes five years to produce a barrister who can help you do legal drafting. But it takes donkey number of years for God to produce a man of God. You see, there's a difference between preaching the Bible and making a sermon. It's a great difference between that and being a message for God. It takes years. And this is what I have touched. I found that when you meet an elder who had experienced God, who has worked with God, Who's, who has internalized the word of God, let him just bring a message from a scripture. Let him speak for 30 minutes. The amount of wisdom that comes out, you cannot compare it with 20 hours of a parrot shouting on the pulpit. Are you hearing me at all? You see, I don't know how to put it, but I want to tell you. The weight of a cutlass is not in the cutlass. It is in the hand that carries it. Even the power of the word of God depends on the life that is driving it. That's why it is too early to lose your preaching. We need it. When all your reverend canons are spoken and all of that, it's okay. They must be given chance. But their chance does not take place. Take your place. There must be that slot where they say the bishop is going to bring a teaching. And as you stand there teaching the word of God, three things are happening. Number one, the purified word. What I want to call the, the, oh, how do I, you know, when wine had been fermented. Eh? When it has become fermented, 
You know, fermented wine is not the same as the one you just tap. Concentrated. You just release small. They can dilute it up and down. It will never lose taste. When you stand up to bring the word of God that had been fermented through experience, through years of service, through years of trials, temptations, and you have become victorious. It brings a different weight to the word of God more than what fresh graduates are preaching. Fresh graduates can speak good English. Am I right? And the Yoruba proverb says, a small child, he can have plenty clothes, but he can never have plenty rags like an elder. Is that a local proverb that you are familiar with? Eh? And what is that? They are simply saying, you can know how to talk boo -boo 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 like that. But an elder comes in with experience and say, this is how it is. I have worked with God over these years. This is the answer to that matter. It settles. That's the first crucial oversight that I want to pray that you will not miss. Praise the Lord. That crucial issue is what forms the basis of continuous power in leadership. Can I tell you, sir, you can still go and plant a church. Eh? G-O. You can still go and do what? And plant a church. You can still ask them to gather a crusade for you in a place and you teach and you preach. And for three days, souls are getting saved. They say, I just want the bishop to pray for me. I just want the bishop to pray for me. When you finish, you have already prepared a vicar that you are going to leave behind. And you say, gather up the fragments. Let nothing be lost. You see, the, that's the matter. That's what I'm dealing with. It takes Jesus to break the bread. It takes Jesus to multiply five loaves. But he does not need to be the one carrying it up and down and serving it. There's nothing big in serving the bread that has already been provided. Am I right? And when the people finish eating, there's nothing big in asking the young people to do what? To gather the fragments. That's how they did mission in the New Testament. It is leaders that went. They are the ones that broke grants. It will enhance your spiritual ministry and oversight over the people. It will subdue men under you. It will silence gainsayers. I won't be here as a, a bishop. Hmm? He's only, he only know how to sit under the air con. No? Eh? We are the ones sweating it out. If there's a boy that spoke like that and you stood up, you don't need to answer him. You only need to tell stories. Stories of where we went. Stories of how we were on the, on the boat. And the boat was about to capsize. And I said, Jesus! And the hand of the Lord just turned the boat. And it stabilized. Hallelujah. <laughs> when you finish telling that story. And I say, and last week. Last week. I was at the Wuri. Uh -huh. Some people know Tewure, have you? <laughs> Say, I was at Tewure. 
And as I got to the church, the young people have not gathered. I started singing. They said, the bishop is around. The man of God is around. The church was full. And as I finished preaching the word of God, many of them gave their life to Christ. And I asked Reverend Bankole to, to stay behind and make sure that he follows them all for the next one week and reports to me. Now, that boy that was shouting that you are always in the year come, what happened to his mouth now? Don't miss that crucial issue of oversight. All other exercise of spiritual oversight emanates from it. Hallelujah. May the Lord help us. Permit me to stop on that because the next issues that I was going to be looking at, they are only growing out of this issue. And if you agree with me that I'm not going to be an armchair bishop and I'm not going to be a parlor overseer and I'm not going to be sitting around fires, I want to walk out of that I can delegate all of those and drag men behind me onto where lives are being touched. The church under your hand will experience revival. There are my, some of our leaders here who, who have done things that I deeply appreciate. Some years ago, I used to visit the Undo Douses. And the bishop decided that he was going to do, is it quarterly Anglican uh, night or Anglican teaching? And he himself is going to stand up there and as his ministry is casting out devils. Do you know what is happening? All the Pentecostals thought that they were the exclusive owners of casting out demons. What happened to them? They started being silent. Anglican people say, look, we're going for our own IVG. God is doing something. When our bishop stands up and he casts out demons, you just see them flying. Do you know that all those ones that are putting a jelly inside water and they're spraying on people's head, they began to lose their business. It takes leadership to move the body of Christ forward. I want to ask you this morning, Within the short space that we have had, would you like to pray about that? That's the first crucial issue. So when we are saying exercising spiritual oversight over the flock, over the pastors under us, over the vision of the church, over the, over the doctrine, these are things I'm coming back by the grace of God for us to deal with. Because I don't know who else can be the custodian of the doctrine. I don't know who else would be able to be the custodian of the vision that your denomination should be pursuing now. I don't know who else will be the custodian of the virtues and the values that our forefathers labored to establish. And I don't know who else can provide and exercise spiritual oversight over men who are also pastors in our denomination. If it is not you. But I okay, can I said all of those other issues which we will deal with when God gives us opportunity, they are only derivatives of this. Can we stand together and pray?
Oh, use me, Lord. Use evil me. Just as thou wilt. And well, and well. Please talk to God. Exercise of spiritual oversight is not possible if it is not first an exercise of your own life. Exercising spiritual oversight over others, over the flock, is only a derivative of the exercise of your own life. Holy Spirit, please do a work in our midst this morning. The church need visionary leaders. Those who themselves are exploring God. They want to experience God. And so they are leading others into experiencing God. Please pray and say, God, I am too young to die out. The first set of men that must move are the leaders. Move us, O oh God, that we may move your people. This has been Living Seed. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House. P.O. Box 971 Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036 0703 Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org.